Well, good morning, everyone. We're in the book of Luke, and we're back in chapter 13 today. The, the, the highlight passage I have here for today is, Ju- is Jesus' lament over Jerusalem. He says this in uh, verse 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who, one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were unwilling. Jesus is going to talk about the kingdom of God, and we're going to get into some deep stuff. Any of you ever wanted to go to Bible college? Today's a good day for you to listen up, (laughs) because I'm going to dig into some deep things for you to show you how to be able to understand and read the word of God in its context and understand some of the principles of how it is that you interpret a passage. Because we have two very short parables in the very beginning, which are going to be easy as you look at them on the, on the surface. And yet, Jesus is saying something else. And so we're going to take a look at that. And hopefully you guys will be understanding uh, of why I'm doing this. Last week, we looked at Jesus speaking to... Uh, largely the the religious folk who were all twisted out of shape. First, there were some folks who said, hey, listen, did you hear about this accident and those people died? Isn't that a terrible thing? And Jesus said, well, do you think they were any worse off than anyone else? Do you think they were more evil than anyone else? But unless you likewise repent, you will also perish. So Jesus said, why are you so concerned about the affairs of everyone else? What about you? essentially. And and my goodness, all you have to do is open your phone or look on the news and everyone's talking about everyone else. It's almost a distraction from talking about yourself and your own standing before God. And Jesus talks about a tree not bearing fruit and how the the vine dresser said, well, give it a little while. Let me fertilize it, throw some manure on it and see if some fruit comes back. Give it about a year. And if it doesn't give fruit, then we'll cut it down. But if it does, then you, you got your tree. And Jesus is talking about us bearing fruit and repenting and about how he's not going to wait forever for us to produce fruit in our lives. As believers, I think there's a time when he'll give you over to a thing. And unfortunately, uh, that happens frequently with us. Although I, I would hope it wouldn't happen to many of us. And then there's this woman in the synagogue and she's all bent over and He sees her and he heals her on the Sabbath and the Sabbath is a big deal for the Jews and they don't think you should do anything other than lay horizontal. But if you took a lot of, if you had to pull a lever to get your feet up in a chair, maybe that would be a problem. That's too much work. And they rebuked the crowd for coming out on Sunday (laughs) or or their Sabbath, which would be Saturday, to be healed. And Jesus says, if you have a donkey, I mean, wouldn't you... Don't you loose your donkey so you can go eat or get some water? Of course you would. Well, what about this woman? She's she's a daughter of Abraham. She's been this way for 18 years. Don't you think that she should be let loose of her infirmity? And Jesus heals her. So that's what we went over last week. This week we're going to talk about the kingdom of God. I'm just going to go through it quickly if you'd read along with me. And then he said... What is the kingdom of God like? To what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and he put in his garden, and it grew and it became a large tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. And again he said, To what shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until it was all leavened. And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. And then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will come to enter and will not be able. And once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. Then you will begin to say, well, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, 
all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. They will come from the east and from the west and the north and the south and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are last who will be first. And there are first who will be last. On that very day, some Pharisees came to him saying, uh, get out and depart from here for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, go tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I will journey today, tomorrow and the day following for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. And assuredly, I say to you, you shall not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now I know what you're thinking. Pastor, this is a communion Sunday. You think you're going to get through all that? <laughs> Perhaps. I will try to be short. Jesus begins by giving us a parable. A parable is a story that comes alongside. Para, meaning to, to come alongside. And he's explaining a story about the kingdom of God so that we might understand what the kingdom of God is. I wonder... What is the kingdom of God? And is it different from the kingdom of heaven when Jesus also mentions the kingdom of heaven? And how is it different from the kingdom of Christ? When I open up a passage and I see something written here, I, I try to ask myself all of these questions of the text so that I might understand the meaning of the text and what it means. I think anytime you read, if you're, if you're not just leisurely reading through like a novel, if you're studying it because it is the very word of God sent to us, you have to understand that it has treasures and meaning to open up to you that the Holy Spirit will apply. Amen? And that's worth digging a little. Somebody told me once, if you rake on the top of the ground, you'll get leaves, but if you dig deeper, you'll find diamonds. And so it's like that with the word of God. Two very simple parables, one's about a mustard seed and the other's about leaven. So, the kingdom of God, it occurs 90 verses in the New King James Version. So the kingdom of God is rather important, I would assume, right? And yet, if I were to ask you, what is the kingdom of God? I wonder how many of you would have a, a distilled answer. And that's okay, because that's why I'm here. The kingdom of heaven occurs 40 verses in the New King James Version. And the last one, the kingdom of Christ, occurs once. And it's right here in Ephesians 5, where it says, For you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Actually, Christ gets top billing. God gets second billing. But because he's equal, that's not a big deal. Amen. So, is Jesus referring to a historical kingdom, the kingdom of God? We know that the Messiah will come and he will sit on the throne of his father, David. So we have to have some history involving that. Is it a political kingdom? Is it something where he's going to rule and reign over all the people? Well, in politics, that's what that basically is all about. Is it a geographical kingdom? Can, can you put, is it the boundaries of Jerusalem? Is it the, the boundaries of Israel? Is it physical or spiritual? And is it now... Or is it later? These are all good questions. If you want to know about a kingdom, you want to know if it's now or later. You want to know if it's spiritual or actual. You want to know if it's geographical, right? You ask these questions. I'm sure you do. So what is the kingdom of God? Since it's spoken of prolifically in the New Testament, and it's also spoken of in the Old Testament, what in the world is it? Because the scripture speaks a lot about the kingdom of God. In Matthew 5, verses 3 and 10, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so I want to be poor in spirit because I want to be in the kingdom. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the 
kingdom of heaven. So, okay, I want to be persecuted. Well, maybe I don't want to be persecuted, but it says, blessed are you if you're persecuted because yours is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Jesus says it's the first thing we should seek. It's a good idea to have an identity as to what in the world is the kingdom of God, right? Yes. Now, all depending on what church you sit in, you're going to hear a different explanation, but that's why I'm showing you the scriptures to confuse you. <laughs> Luke 11:2. 2, so he said to them, when you pray, say, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if it's the first thing we're supposed to seek, and if we're supposed to pray concerning the kingdom, it's a good idea that we have an understanding what that kingdom is. Matthew 5, 20 says, For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. We know that Jesus speaks in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus. He says, unless you're born again, you will never see the kingdom of God. So there are all of these passages speaking of the kingdom. And if you're not careful, you could just read over them like it's a speed bump that you just forgot was there and just keep going and not understand what he's saying. In Mark 1, 14 and 15. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. But if you don't know what the kingdom of God is, you're going to be like, okay, it's here. What's here? If Santa was here, I'd know. But the kingdom of God, fuzzy. Mark 10, 14 and 15. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for such is the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God belongs to little children. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. The kingdom of God is something that must be received. There's not a roadmap. <laughs> it needs to be received. Matthew 19, 24, and again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is to be entered, but it's going to be really hard for people who are rich, right? You guys are following me, right? Okay, because this is all from the Bible. You could check it. I have references. Matthew 12, 28, but if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Hmm. So does that mean the kingdom of God came then when Jesus showed up? In Luke 17, 20 and 21. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered and said to them, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. Interesting. This is what it speaks of the kingdom. And since it's a big part of what Jesus spoke, what John spoke, and when it's part of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's rather important. So getting back to our text, oh, Mark 4, 11 says, and he said to them, to you, it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables. Jesus explained what the kingdom was all about through stories, parables, where you liken something unto something else. And he's done this several times. There are at least seven parables of the kingdom in the scriptures. I'm going to go over two others that are not listed here today. And he said, <coughs> the kingdom of God is as a man should scatter seed on the ground and it should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow and he himself does not know how. So the kingdom of God is a bit of a mystery. And the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, and then after that full grain in the head. And when the grain ripens immediately, he puts a sickle because the harvest has come. So he says the kingdom of God is like a guy that scatters seed, throws it in the ground, and it grows overnight, day and night, day and night, day and night. The secret is in the seed. It grows. It has life in it. It knows exactly what to do. It was programmed and designed that way. Otherwise, it could never do that. You ever think, how could seeds evolve? 
How do you get a seed that is so complex, all of the things that happens there, how do you evolve a seed? Something just that simple, it's remarkable. Jesus speaks another one in Matthew 13, 24 to 30. Another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Notice the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are synonymous and it's about seeds. Sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. By the way, tares are weeds, weeds that look just like wheat. They grow up, they grow a fuzzy head and no fruit. There's no kernels in them. Wheat grows up, has that fuzzy head, but it has kernels of wheat, which you take, you can uh, have a fistful of granola or you can grind them up and make into flour and then make into bread. And when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So you don't see them until they begin growing up. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Who were the servants of the owner? Us. Interesting. There's some complaints before God about some people who were supposed to be good seed, but they're not. That's the place to take it, by the way. Didn't you sow good seed in your field? Then how does it have tares? And he said to them, an enemy has done this. The servants said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? You want us to tear them out? I'll take them down, Lord. But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Do you realize in your zeal to try to take out some tares, you might take out some wheat? Hmm. I know we're not studying this, but anyway. You don't want to tear up and uproot the wheat with the tares. But let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, who are the reapers? The angels. Jesus defines this later. If you've read ahead, you understand. First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them and gather the wheat into my barn. Who's the wheat? You guys, I hope. So Jesus is teaching a parable about the kingdom of God and he uses parables. So what is the kingdom of God? Now that you have all of this information and you've looked at all of these passages, certainly not all of them, what is the kingdom of God? Here's the simplest answer. Everywhere God is king. Everywhere God is king. Is the kingdom of God within you? Does God sit upon the throne of your heart? Is he the one ruling and reigning? Then you have the kingdom of God inside of you. Do you live your life out in the regular world in submission to the domain and the rule of God? Then you are in the kingdom of God. It is not some future hope of heaven. Of course, that is ultimately the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God is when we are being in submission to his rule. Amen? That's what the kingdom of God is. So now I feel like we could jump into these parables and take a look. When interpreting a parable, you have to understand it's not a, a, it's a, a story Jesus is telling to come alongside something else. And you have to be careful that you don't interp interpret a parable like you would prophecy. Just like you don't interpret a dream the same way as you do just didactic teaching where Jesus is laying out line by line, this is how you should live and do. He talks about a mustard seed. By the way, that's the size of a mustard seed. If you have what's called mustard in a little McCormick's thing at home, that's what it looks like. And it's, uh, you don't want to go chomping on these things. They're pretty powerful. <laughs> but that's what a mustard seed looks like. And he says, what do I compare to the kingdom of God? It's a mustard seed, which a man took and he put in his garden and it grew and became a large tree and the birds of the air nested in its branches. It's interesting because Jesus talked about a mustard seed before. It says here in Matthew 17, 20. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly, I say to you, you have, if you have the faith, of a, faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, what is Jesus saying? 
He's saying if you had just that much faith that God is who he is and that he would do what he said he would do, you could speak to a mountain, it would disappear. You know the place he says you could take a tree and torn up and thrown in the ocean and it would be. And each of those has significance, but I'm not going to go into that now. Just so that you know, in Palestine, this is what a gigantic mustard plant looks like. Okay, they can get up to about uh, 14 feet or so, which is uh, the very top limb of that thing hanging out there. This is what it looks like when it's completely full grown and allowed to uh, just go its way. Usually they're much smaller bushes and you kind of trim them down like you might a holly. You kind of keep them small so that you can get all the, uh, all the, little, the little seeds off of them and use them. But that's what it looks like. Ezekiel 17, 23 Actually, it's a good idea when you're looking at scripture to look back because Jesus is speaking to a Jewish audience. And what he says here in Ezekiel 17, 23, he says, on the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it, referring to Israel as a tree, and I will bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a majestic cedar. Under it will dwell birds of every sort, the shadow of its branches, they will dwell. So, Israel is known as this tree, you know, very often a fig tree, or very often a vine, which bears fruit. And he says he's going to plant this thing up on a hill. By the way, that's where Jerusalem is. And its boughs are going to reach out, and there are these animals, the birds of the air, that are going to come and roost under its branches and kind of be protected. So it's this image of animals being able to find protection under a tree. In Daniel 4.21, it talks something similar. Well, if you know the, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar where there's this giant tree and it gets cut down and all of that, here in chapter 4, verse 21, it says, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt and in whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home. So trees are known as the homes of birds, right? And so for a mustard seed to become a giant tree and house birds in its branches sounds very familiar to some of the Old Testament language, right? So how would we interpret such a passage? Small but powerful. He's likening the seed unto the kingdom of God. Small and yet powerful. It possesses life in itself, much like a seed does. It's planted by man in a place of potential. You don't just throw it on the sidewalk. You put it in a place where it can grow. It grows exponentially to be a haven of rest for life for others, right? So Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God, extends to a place where we all enjoy his provision and his protection. That makes a lot of sense, right? As we look at this parable about the kingdom of God, the first thing. Everybody happy with that? Seems to be the plain sense. Now, I'm going to introduce you to two new vocabulary words. Exegesis. Everybody say exegesis. exegesis. And it's got nothing to do with Jesus the Savior. It's different. And hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. Okay. Which is the process of looking at the scripture, dis deciding what in the world it says which is exegesis, and hermeneutics is, okay, what do I do with this and how do I apply it? So this is the science of understanding what God's word actually says, so that you don't walk away with some deceptive, twisted view of what it says. Make sense? Yes. And there are principles in this. You, you do a good exegesis, which is what does it say? And sometimes it involves going back to the original language uh, and finding out what the exact words were, the order of those words whether they're feminine, masculine, whether it's active, aorist, anyway, before I bore all of you incredibly, it's about interpretation, validation, which is why do you believe what you believe it says, and then application, which is what do I do with this and how do I apply it to my life today? Here's the golden rule of interpretation for all of you. When the plain sense of scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Therefore, take every word at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning, unless the facts of the immediate context studied in the light of related passages and axiomatic and fundamental truths indicate clearly otherwise. <laughs> in other words, take the word of God literally, period. What does it say? What's it say just in your face? What's it say? Now, if it says something and you go, well, that can't possibly be the case. 
because Jesus said this and this and this and this and this. Well, then you can't accept that as being your understanding. So there must be something else there. So it should cause us to dig, right? You guys know what I'm talking about. You read the scriptures on a regular basis. That's the first rule. The plain sense makes sense. Don't look for anything else that makes just common sense. Just accept it. Now, there are some others. The scripture is literal. It's not all metaphor. Unless you're talking about parables or dreams, you're talking about something that's literal. It's real. When Jesus said that, he really meant what he said. Make sense? Number two, it's historical. He said it in a context of a certain time frame to certain people. You and I are not historical Jews. We don't live in the first century. And so the people that Jesus was speaking to would have a different understanding as to what he said than you and I might. So we have to know something of the history of the people in the context of what Jesus is saying. Grammatical, how was it said? And understanding that gets into the original languages in the Hebrew and the Greek. Contextual, what's before it, what's after it? Because that has a lot to do with what it means, right? You guys are following me, right? All right, I hope you're all taking notes mentally. Contextual. <sighs> Expositional con constancy. Expositional constancy is God tends to communicate the same way all the time to us. Right? He uses things from the Old Testament as shadows and the New Testament then illuminates them. So Christ is somewhat concealed in the Old Testament, but he's revealed in the New Testament. So you have to understand that there's a consistency. When Jesus says certain things, there's a constancy with the rest of scripture. Like I showed you the scriptures of the birds underneath the branches and all of that. So all of that ties in internal consistency. You want to make sure that it matches the other scriptures, that it doesn't say something hard. If you've, if you've got something that you don't understand, you should compare it to the things that you do understand. Make sense? That's how you get a difficult passage. You have to look at the broad base of information so that you don't misunderstand it. The principle of first mention when something is mentioned first in the scripture, it has a lot to say about the principle, like blood. First time blood was shed was by God himself. That says something. That's a powerful message. It's not an accident. It's on purpose. All of the scripture is. And so we look at the mention, first mention. Use clear passages to interpret the obscure ones. We talked about that. If you find a really difficult passage, if you're in Hebrews 6 and, and 8, if you're in these passages where it seems like, oh, I could lose my salvation. Well, what does the rest of the scripture say? Take a difficult passage and compare it to what you already know. So I want you to know that the mustard plant is not a large tree. That's something historical that we should know. And when Jesus is speaking to them, he's saying this mustard tree becomes this giant tree. The people back then would go, what? The mustard tree, there's no something, there's a mustard bush pretty much. And you saw one that was way out of control. So what does that mean now? Now that we add this little historical bit to it. And secondly, Jesus recently uses birds of the air as demonic forces. You remember when he, he spoke the first parable that he spoke, he spoke of seeds. He says, the, the kingdom of God is like a, a man who went and planted seed. And some of it fell by the side and it fell on the, the path. And it, the birds of the air came and took that seed away. And the seed is the word of God, Right. So he used birds in a very negative sense. And by the way, you'll find predominantly in the, in, the, um, in the scriptures that birds are not spoken of very highly. Sorry, honey, I know you love birds. But it's, it's kind of an axiomatic thing where the birds are not considered nice guys, okay? And if you were a farmer, you would definitely agree because the birds come and eat all your seed when you're planting and they start, you know, hacking up your corn while it's standing on the, on the stalk. And the farmers would understand they wish they had a shotgun. So that's called the, the, the principle of first mention. When Jesus tells his first parable about the kingdom, he talks about the birds of the air. So having these two, a historical and a first mention, actually involved in your interpretation of the scripture, when you look at this one passage about the mustard seed, and Jesus says that it becomes a large tree and the birds of the air nested in its branches, what in the world does that mean? I've lost you all. 
this is the kind of stuff that I have to do every week. <laughs> so now we've got birds and a tree. Now, what has that got to do with the kingdom of God? Well, let's go back to our parable. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, which a man took and put in his garden, and it grew and became a large tree, which is unusual. And the birds of the air nested in its branches. Is this perhaps a right hermeneutic? Small but powerful, possesses life in itself, planted by man in a place of potential, grows exponentially to be a haven of rest for weird birds. The kingdom of God could be spoken of like that. Have you ever turned TBN on? There's some weird birds on there. It could be that Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is one of those things that's going to take off so rapidly that what's going to infest the church are demonic forces. Like the wheat and the tares. Jesus says he was the son of man, went and planted, and then someone put tares and split and said, hey, what's going on? Didn't you plant good seed? Yeah, I did, but an enemy did this. Let them grow up together. And the servant said, do you want us to pull them up? No, don't do that because you might pull the wheat up at the same time. So just wait until they're full grown. Do you see how they work together? Now, you may prefer interpretation number one because it's a very positive. A mustard seed, the word of God comes and it just takes life. The kingdom of God takes off and by golly, the, the whole world is just right. It could be that. Or it could be that it becomes so big that it gets infested with those who are not necessarily those who are of God. So do you see how hard it is, the business of actually looking at a Bible verse and determining what in the world is being said? What does it mean? I'm just trying to confuse you all, really. <laughs> if any of you thought, hey, I could do this job. You could. But it's a whole lot of work. I could tell you that. So, and again, we're going to look at the second one. And again, he said, to what shall we like in the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until it was all leavened. And you say, wow, that's nice. I like bread. Bread's nice. And she says, it's like leaven that you take and you knead into a bunch of dough and you put it aside and you wait till it's all risen. And then what you do is you take it out and you make bread for everybody, right? Maybe you did that for Christmas. I know Monica certainly did. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. And so this is, this is what you do. So it's the act of making something. So the kingdom of God is like leaven that makes everything all puffy and squishy and wonderful and so nice to heat up and put bread on. And I am so hungry. And you can make bread, right? And it's, that's what the kingdom of God is like. It's like a good loaf of bread. Why does she hide it? You see, you have to ask questions of the passage. Why does she hide it? It's interesting. Didn't say put it in a dark place or, or didn't say, uh, you know, put it in a place where it could rise or put it in the refrigerator. Hid it has a definite connotation, doesn't it? How would a Jewish listener react to the hearing of this? Well, by the way, 98 times there is leaven or yeast mentioned in the scripture. 97 out of those 98 times, it's a representative of sin. So when Jesus says that the kingdom of God is like leaven, the Jews who are listening would go. Because leaven almost always means sin. It's a picture of contamination. Hmm. What is the context of this parable? What did he say before? What does he say after? Does it tie in? It does tie in because if you remember, he was talking to the people in the synagogue who got all on him about not being right on the Sabbath and healing a woman. There's contamination, serious contamination in this religious system. Yeah, leaven works. And by the way, how much is three measures? You know, if you, if you have a teaspoon or if you have a tablespoon or if you have a cup or if you have a, you know, 
a five gallon bucket, it's all going to make a difference, right? All of these things have a bearing on what Jesus was trying to say and how we should interpret it properly. So here we are, small but powerful, possesses life in itself, planted by a woman in a place of potential. It grows exponentially to be a dough fit for a delicious loaf of bread. Well, that's one way to be able to read it, and that's the way some people would interpret it. Notice the similarity to the previous parable, at least to my little note here on the bottom. It's powerful because it goes through the entire loaf. It possesses life in itself. You don't have to do anything. You just put it away. It does it all by itself, like the mustard seed. Planted by a woman, not a man this time, a woman, equal opportunity, in a place of potential, in a place where, the, where there is there's goo that it can feed on and grow, okay? Especially, uh, it grows exponentially to be a dough fit for a delicious loaf of bread. That would be our, our hermeneutic and how it would break down for everybody to eat. Leaven and yeast always means a picture of sin. And three measures, by, a way, by the way, would feed 100 people. Anybody making dough for 100 people. Now, that certainly has some bearing on how we're going to view the passage, right? Three measures, I figure, oh, that's three cups, you know, that's a, that's a pizza, you know, maybe a, maybe a Sicilian. So how do we view this scripture? Is it really this delicious loaf of bread at the end of it? Or is it this mammoth gigantic, by the way, that's a world record piece of bread right there, Guinness World Book of Records, they did it in Brazil. Anyway, you don't need this. What is Jesus saying? I see a similar thing to the previous parable. It's like a woman who hid leaven and a loaf and it leavened the entire loaf, all 100 servings of it. Is Jesus talking about contamination coming into the kingdom of God? I think he is. Is it something where if you prefer the lighter version is that going to be a real problem with your salvation? I don't think so. But if you look in the context of it, you see Jesus is trying to reprove a deeply religious system that has forgotten God is king. And it's about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, unfortunately, can be contaminated by sin, which is why we check ourselves. And when we take the word, of, when we take the, the, the cup and the bread so that we don't bring judgment on ourselves. So, you guys get an idea how deep this thing can go and how complex it can get and how difficult and how easily it is to grab hold of what you think is the interpretation and just run with it and then try to find everything else to fit into your paradigm. It's one of the most exciting things about my job. So you just got a little glimpse in a couple of verses of what I have to do for you so that I don't mess it up. And, and aren't you glad we're done with the college portion? <laughs> and he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. By the way, if you remember, he has, he has finished his plan A, teaching around these areas, and now he's heading towards Jerusalem. And what's going to happen there? He's going to be crucified. He's going to be rejected. He's going to be handed over. He's going to be crucified. Jesus, from this point, slightly before, he's got his eyes fixed on Jerusalem. And he knows where he's going, and he knows what's going to happen. He knows all of it. Just like we do looking back, he knew looking forward. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? You see, the question is prompted by his teaching about the leaven and the mustard seed and the birds. Wow, I, I thought... I thought Israel, see, they thought if you were Jewish, you're in. You got your golden ticket because you're related to Abraham. No, I'm, I'm one of Abraham's children. I'm in. What about your life? What about the way you're living? Lord, are there few who will be saved? Well, that's a good question. Are there few who will be saved? You guys are well taught. You know. And he said to them, strive, by the way, the word is agonizo, where we get the word agonize. It's like what an athlete does when they're in the last mile of their marathon. Agonize, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. 
Jesus is coming down with a very hard line here, which ties in with the previous two parables about the kingdom of God. It's not all fun and games. It's not just eating healthy bread. He talks about a gate. A, a gate could either be a doorway or a gate. They're, they're both the same way. In fact, your eye is a gate and we're told to protect it. So why aren't they going to be able to enter it? Is there somebody standing there? You can't enter. Maybe it's one of those birds. You can't enter. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You've got to do more. You've got to give more money. You've got to turn TBN on. You see a bunch of that. Is it you can't enter because there's somebody prohibiting you from it? Or could it be that the stuff that you carry there is too much and you're attached to it and you're never going to get through the door? People will tell you, oh, you believe what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That seems pretty narrow. That's exactly the point. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes before the Father except through him, which means there's a whole bunch of stuff you're going to have to take off, and the only person standing between you and him is your faith and taking him at his word and surrendering your life. You're your own worst enemy. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you. That sounds very familiar. You remember the sheep and the goats in Matthew where Jesus puts the sheep on his right and the goats on his left and he goes through the dissertation with them. He says, I, I don't know you. I never knew you which tells me it's about having a relationship with Jesus, not an understanding of law keeping and trying to do your best and oh God, you know that I'm a failure every single day. It's a relationship. I do not know you, where you are from. And then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence. Is that enough? Do you think being here today and having communion, you think that's enough to get you in? And you taught in our streets. So you were our neighbor. You were nearby. Not enough. But he will say, I will tell you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Jesus is saying some very difficult things here, isn't he? It's interesting because in, in this world, we don't speak difficult things to people. We don't say things like this because I think we lack courage, we lack conviction. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. And if you haven't entered into in a relationship with him, you're not going to make it regardless of how many church services, how much money you give, how many good deeds you do, how you try to undo the evil inside you. Whatever you plan on doing this year, I'm going to work out more, I'm going to eat less, I'm going to... You're not going to gain your soul unless you give it up for the Lord Jesus Christ. So, right now, Jesus is knocking on our heart's door, and we have an opportunity to let him in. There's going to come a time when he shuts the door, and it's all done. And it's coming. How many people do you love that don't know Jesus? I'm, I'm preaching to myself. There's a time when God's going to draw the line and it'll be all over. Revelation 3, 19 and 20, it said here, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. You know who's saying that? Jesus. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. Notice the language. I will come into him. The kingdom of God is where? I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Where's he going to dine? In here. If you don't know what it is to have the spirit of God inside of you and have a connection to God himself, you're missing the greatest joy in life.
is to have a relationship with God. There is a day coming when all choices will have been made. It's a little like your taxes, but you don't have a makeup date. Hebrews 3.15 says, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. That's from one of the Psalms. If the Lord is speaking to you here today, do not delay in putting off your relationship with the Lord. You can have one today. Amen? Amen. And it doesn't matter whether you're on the other end of this camera or whether you're in this room. You have an opportunity to make amends with God by admitting, <laughs> I need a savior because I'm lost and I need you to save me. It's that simple. And there will be a day when those choices will be no more. Today is the day. Verse 28, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's always a reference to hell, by the way. And if you don't think it exists, it's because you don't read the scriptures. Then you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. Who's he speaking to? Yourselves? The Jewish people. Because they thought they had a golden ticket. And he says, everybody's going to come from where? Everywhere. There might be few that get saved, but they're going to come from everywhere. There's no exclusion, male or female, slave or free, Jew or Gentile. There is no boundary. There'll be all types coming in but there won't be huge numbers from every type. They will come from the east, from the west, from the north and the south and sit down in the kingdom of God. This obviously is the kingdom of God future, isn't it? And indeed, there are last who will be first and first who will be last. It's called the wedding supper of the lamb. And it says that the Lord is going to serve us. Jesus is going to serve me. I feel a little like Peter. No, Lord, let me do it. And that's where we're going to be. I love this little invitation. You are invited to come and dine with me from now throughout all to eternity. Believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost and dine with Jesus as your host. To live in heaven eternally, all you must do is RSVP. Isn't that nice? Oh. It's absolutely true. Jesus invites us to come, and all we do is receive a free gift, something we didn't earn, something we don't deserve, but he's willing to give it, but only for a limited time. I feel like a telemarketer. <laughs> Verse 31, on that very day, some Pharisees came to him saying, uh, get out, depart from here, and Herod wants to kill you. <laughs> They're trying to get rid of Jesus again. And he said to them, go tell that fox, behold, I cast demons, cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. On the third day, I will be perfected. Hmm. Nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. There are people that come to Jesus and say, you, you need to get out of here. You're in deep trouble, man. Pilate's after you. He's going to kill you. They were just trying to get rid of him. When he was over in the land of the Gennesarets and he cast out demons, uh, this demoniac that was there and all these sheep went, or these pigs went over the cliff. They came and said, you got to leave. We, we can't have you here. It costs us too much for you to be here. And it's very similar here. I think they're trying to get rid of Jesus. He's now a three days journey away from Jerusalem as he's going. And he says, I'm on my way. And he says, today I'm going to cast out demons. You know what he's saying? Today, tomorrow, and on the third day, I'm going to do everything God wants me to do, and you're not going to stop me. And it doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what Herod says. It doesn't matter. He's going to kill me. Oh, by the way, he can't kill me until I get to Jerusalem because nobody dies outside of Jerusalem. Only prophets die in Jerusalem, which is the place that you would think is the kingdom of God where people would be receptive of Jesus but they weren't. So the kingdom of God is not necessarily the city of Jerusalem. Jesus said, you tell him, I'm going to go and do what my father tells me to do. And I'm not going to be, notice he says on the third day, I will be perfected. Isn't that rather interesting? You would select that language. It's a foreshadowing of what happens when he's crucified, buried and rises on the third day. 
He's foreshadowing that. Do you see that? Anytime you see third day, you got your ears perk up. And verse 34 and 35, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. Interesting, he calls Herod a fox. Actually, he calls him a vixen, which is a female fox. It's a little bit of a smackdown. And he says here, I'm like a hen wants to gather all my chicks. You see, a vixen comes to tear up chickens. Right, Dino? <laughs> he's got a fox problem and he's got chickens. But Jesus says, I wanted to take you like a mother hen takes her young and brings them under her wings for protection, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. And 70 AD, I believe Jesus is looking forward to the utter destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem. Look what's gone on here, guys. There's contamination in this religious system, and none of what you're doing is free from contamination. Your house is left to you desolate. And assuredly, I say to you, you shall not see me until the time when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He's quoting from one of the Psalms. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, and he holds them accountable to know the time of his arrival and to be ready. And he weeps over them. One of the times when Jesus weeps, he is deeply struck with emotion at their hard heartedness. He's not like helpless. Hoo -hoo, what am I going to do? He's broken hearted over their hard hearts. I wonder how often do we weep over those who have hard hearts? And so you will not he said, blessed is, you're not going to, you shall not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and quotes one of the Psalms, I believe it's 117. It's interesting. That's what they quoted when Jesus came into the town of Jerusalem. You remember that? Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But a week later, they were crying out, crucify him, crucify him. There's a second coming of Jesus Christ. And that's when the Jews during the great tribulation are going to turn and see Jesus as their Messiah and they will weep for the one it says in Zephaniah, I will, they will weep for the one whom they have pierced. They will see him. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our little journey, a little bit of Bible college in the beginning about how to take a parable and how to make it make sense and look at the other parables and understand what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is anywhere where God is king. Is Jesus the king of your heart today? If not, he can be, and he will do all the work. All you have to do is ask him. As the worship team comes up, let's pray. Father, your word is just so powerful. And Jesus, you spoke with courage and assurance, and, and I believe that you hit these guys right between the eyes. And Lord, your Holy Spirit does to us as well when we read your word. I pray that it might be like a seed in our heart that would grow, that you would encourage us, that you would strengthen us, that we would be in the kingdom of God, that we would be one of the servants in the kingdom of God until you come back and take us home. Lord, within the hearing of my voice, there are people who don't know you. I pray you'd save them. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help them to drop all they have before the narrow door of your presence, that they would accept you as the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name, amen.